Pink Flamingos is an accurate documentary about me and the homies, and a groundbreaking piece of cinema highlighting the importance of a particular species of birded wildlife. Produced, written and directed by John Waters, John Waters being someone you very well may have heard of over the years, from his various projects including the Trash Trilogy, Pink Flamingos, Female Trouble and Desperate Living, but also for his far more approachable and mainstream endeavours like the original 1980s Hairspray and 1990s Crybaby starring Johnny Depp. A far cry from his earlier works of the 1960s and 70s, but today what we'll be focusing on is the original entry in the Trash Trilogy Pink Flamingos, because you're all just kind of demented and this is exactly what you want. Oh! The movie begins by introducing us to the character Divine, the proclaimed filthiest person alive, and she aims to keep that title no matter what, indicating from the get-go that almost everything about this movie is going to be in the typical John Waters style of being completely over the top and incredibly exaggerated to the extreme. Divine actually being an old friend of John Waters, Harris Milstead, who actually used the stage name Divine in real life as well as on screen. He'd appeared in many of John's earliest creations from the 60s up until his death in the 80s after appearing in Hairspray, hiding out in her trailer home away from the public eye, for no doubt getting up to various filthy activities, under the name of Babs Johnson, Divine lives with her friend Cotton, son Crackers, and mentally unwell mother, Miss Eddie, who sits in a playpen all day, doing absolutely nothing other than eating various forms of cooked eggs. In other words, she's living the life. Across town, we learn that there's a couple named Connie and Raymond Marble who hate Divine and run an adoption agency. And by run an adoption agency, I mean they kidnap young women, impregnate them, and sell the children for a profit. Still a better investment than crypto. But the reason that they hate Divine so much is not because of all the horrific things that she's done, but because that they're offended that someone else would be given the title of filthiest person alive when they believe it should be attributed to them. But little did they know that this small little thing known as the internet would be created, and that I've seen at least five things on Twitter today far worse than anything shown in this movie, and it's not even lunchtime yet. We then get to see a small glimpse into why Divine and her family are generally regarded as filthy people, as she and her son Crackers drive into town, swerving towards joggers on the road and pretending to pick up hitchhikers, before Divine walks into a store, takes a piece of raw meat, and shoves it up her dress to keep it warm for later. There's a life hack for you. After Divine defecates on someone's front lawn, because why not, we're then introduced to Raymond Marble, as we're perhaps introduced to him a little too much, as he proceeds to flash himself in front of two women and use the opportunity to steal their handbag. Wow. This movie is full of money-making tips. After he's done engaging in his allegedly activities, he returns home to his wife Connie, as we see the pair hire a woman named Cookie to gather information about Divine and her whereabouts by going on a date with her son Crackers. As well as hiring this person to walk into an incredibly dangerous situation, they also proceed to tell her why they believe themselves to be worthy of the title of filthiest people alive by telling her in great detail how they kidnap women, use their servant Channing to impregnate them, before selling their babies for thousands of dollars and killing the mothers. Something which Cookie seems to be completely okay with. Once they've received the money from their little business endeavour, they invest it right back into the community by funding their adult video stores and selling heroin near elementary schools. So instead of simply trying to out Filthy Divine and her family, they plan on using the information by Cookie to make her life as difficult as possible. Which unfortunately results in Cookie heading over to the trailer home and being horrifically assaulted in the shed out back, as Crackers seems to have misplaced his penis for an actual live chicken, killing it in the process. So chicken nuggets are made. All the while, Cotton is watching from outside of the window and clearly very much enjoying the multiple crimes that she is currently witnessing. Because she's just that type of girl. A weird one. And speaking of people being productive members of society, we then see Raymond and Connie pick up a hitchhiker from the side of the road and kidnap her for the baby factory. But this time Channing, the marble servant, relieves himself into a syringe before using that on the newly abducted woman, causing the other captive woman to puke all over the floor because it's just that small, causing me to question all of my life choices that have led up to this moment for me to utter that sentence that I just spoke out of my mouth. Cookie passes on the information about Divine and her poultry keeping son and tells the marbles that Divine is planning a birthday party, giving them the perfect opportunity to send Divine a gift that they've been keeping for months as they've tried to find her whereabouts. And right after Divine's done grilling up her coochie meat, she's delivered a package. After threatening to murder the mailman for delivering mail, she opens it to find the rather disgusting sight of human fecal matter and reacts rather strangely for someone titled the filthiest person alive. 
you'd think she'd be happy with it. But apparently not, as to Divine and the rest of her family, this is an act of war. A war that's only going to end with the sender of this package being killed. Back at the Marbles residence, they discover Channing wearing Connie's clothes and impersonating the both of them as he thought they were out of the house. And after walking in to catch someone doing the most normal thing that's taken place in this movie so far, they decide to lock him up in his bedroom, otherwise known as the cupboard. Something that Channing wasn't doing out of malice, but because he craves to be like both of them and desires their affection deeply, making him the perfect person that they can manipulate into doing their sick bidding. And with Channing locked up in his luxurious penthouse suite, the Marbles head out to spy on Divine's party, now they know where she lives. A party that has absolutely everything that a person could ever want, like a Nazi, some good food, and a guy intensely spreading his cheeks for the amusement of all the guests. After being taught the basics of human biology, Divine's gifted cigarettes, a giant cleaver, and a decapitated pig's head just in case the need would ever arise for her to find herself in a situation where one is needed. The Marbles, like the jealous little narcs that they are, decide to call the police on Divine and all of her party goers, which does absolutely nothing but brighten the moods of absolutely everyone in attendance, as they suddenly begin savagely attacking the responding officers and eating their freshly acquired remains for the extra protein. After the party is concluded, Divine's mother, Miss Edie, leaves with her new fiancé, the Eggman, because sure, why not? And Divine and her son Crackers find out about the marbles, so decide to go and pay them a visit. But after arriving and finding the place completely empty, they do what any normal sane person would do and proceed to wipe their saliva over absolutely everything that they own, because that'll show them. The bedroom, the staircase, the living room and the dining room. Absolutely nothing is safe from the more than likely questionable contents of their saliva glands. Not even Crackers' genitals. Yes, I said that, and no, I won't elaborate. After discovering Channing locked up in his rather spacious bedroom, he tells them about the girls being kept downstairs, and much to my surprise, they actually decide to set them free. I thought they'd notice a lucrative business opportunity when presented to them, but apparently not. After they find the women begging for help, they explain what the marbles have been using them for, so decide to set them free and hand them over a knife to use on Channing, which they use to make sure he will never impregnate anyone ever again or do much of anything ever again for that matter. While Divine and Crackers are away, the Marbles are on their property dousing their trailer with gasoline and burning it to the ground for no other reason than they just kinda don't like her very much. Something that greatly upsets Divine and her family as they return to their mobile home to find it viciously burning to the ground with one of the pink flamingos melting into a pile outside. Something that represents the viewer's brain while watching this movie. And in a scene that's not exactly explained, so quite like all of the others, after returning to their freshly moisturised home, the marbles find themselves being thrown from all of the furniture because I told you there was something in that saliva. Yeah, don't read into it too far. After their table is flipped over by a particularly angry drop of saliva, they find Channing downstairs castrated with the women gone. They realise that this little business of theirs is over, so run upstairs quickly to get their things to flee, but find themselves confronted by an armed divine, crackers and cotton, who have been patiently waiting for them. The marbles then suddenly decide to pretend like they have absolutely no idea who divine and her family is, something which does absolutely next to nothing to save them, as they then find themselves being transported back to the burnt out mobile home, where Divine has requested the attendance of various news crews and reporters for the whole world to witness their very legitimate court case that's going to end with the grand spectacle of a live homicide. And after being found guilty on all ten counts of first degree stupidity, they're tied to a tree, tarred and feathered, and executed without an ounce of hesitation. After all of the reporters leave in a rather jolly manner, due to the excitement of the story that they're going to print, Divine, Crackers and Cotton decide that it's time for them to move somewhere else, where they plan to live out of gas station toilets to strengthen their filth. And right before this family-friendly flick comes to an end, as they're on their way to their new destination, they decide to stop at the side of the road so Divine can eat freshly dropped dog feces. A scene that is unfortunately very much real, as out of character, Harris Milstead, who plays Divine, told a reporter that they followed that dog around for three hours, and that he rang the emergency room pretending that his child had eaten it to see if that he would face any possible side effects. Apparently there wasn't any, but I'm not going to put that to the test. So before this video comes to an end, I'd like to just give a big shout out to all of the YouTube members and patrons, the people who every month continue to support the channel, something which I greatly appreciate. If you're interested in becoming a YouTube member or patron yourself, not only are you just generally being a great help, but you also get access to a few little perks, like being able to join the private Discord server, where you can then see uncensored versions of all videos going forwards. So starting off with this week's new YouTube signups, a massive thank you to Kilowatt, Chaos, Nick Cyrax, Simon, Bob Urcho, 
Bassengla, Lucas, NUDS, Jaron De La Cruz, Kisjin Atapot, Leonardo Matias, Splendide, Jack Lane, and Whelming Crit. Now heading over to this week's new Patreon signups, a massive thank you to Liam Ryan, Spart450, Bottle98, Oza, Jill Norris, Rolling Sushi, Thomas Kemp, Poop, Nisha Bug, Fatboy, Jack Todd, Andrew Thomas, Finley, Katie Lee, Replexity, Tiny Tim, and Petrol Sniffin. So once again, a massive shout out to all of the YouTube members and patrons, and a big thank you to everyone else for watching.